It was just a, a normal walk that Elisa had t taken hundreds of times before. Um, and so that was the last walk that she took and she disappeared and, and we've never seen her since. Look how many people are coming together for this little 13 year old girl that went missing 35 years ago, that she means so much more than just a poster on the wall or a case number. She was a human being. Words from a family that has been in pain for 35 years, wondering what happened to their missing loved one. But that pain got amplified a few years ago thanks to comments from law enforcement and maybe some actions by them. What's going on with this case? It is definitely time to turn on the searchlight for Elisa Roberson. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me and especially for caring about these cases like I do. So this is a case from 1989, 35 years ago, that Blanca Elisa Roberson went missing. She went by the name Elisa. So in most uh, media that you're going to find on this case, they're just referring to her as Elisa Roberson. Here at missingkids.org, of course, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, we have a picture of her, how she looked at the time that she went missing. Now they have done a few different age composites. It looks like they've got the most recent one up here as well. This might be what she looks like at this period. Unfortunately, this is one of those cases where people working on it think that there is a very high probability of some foul play being involved here. Let's start at NamUs with the basics of this case. Date of last contact, August 6th, 1989. That would have been a Sunday evening, essentially, that she went out and never came home. Missing from Aransas Pass, Texas, at the age of 13, she would currently be 48 years old. And in terms of other details, she stood at about five feet tall at that time and weighed around 120 pounds. For circumstances of disappearance, not a whole lot, but it says Blanca was en route to a friend's house between 4.30 and 5 p.m. and has not been seen since. I just want to note right off the bat that information that her sister is putting out in recent years has that time frame slid by about an hour. Uh, it was more between 5.30 and 6 p.m that Elisa actually went out. She was wearing a light blue Mickey Mouse t-shirt and blue shorts. She also has a scar on her right knee. Black hair, brown eyes, uh, and for the scar on the right knee, there's also a scar on her left thigh, but that's all that we have for distinctive physical features. Um, we don't even have a shoe description. I believe I've seen in other places where it just said sneakers or tennis shoes, and we do have a couple photos here. Where is this taking place? Uh, Aransas Pass, Texas. It's located on the shore of Redfish Bay, a tidal water body between Corpus Christi Bay to the south and Aransas Bay to the north. The city is on the mainland of Texas and is connected to Mustang Island by a six mile long causeway and a free ferry that carries vehicles to the island. By Texas State Highway 35 and U.S. Route 181, Aransas Pass is 20 miles northeast of Corpus Christi. So close to the water and with a lot, of, a lot of water around it. Of course, we're always concerned about that with missing persons cases. Uh, here we can see that as of 2020, population around 7,900. Back at the time she went missing, that was more like in the 6,500 range or so. And this is one of the other age composites that they did along the way. Uh, I believe this would have been estimated for her to have been around 18 years old at the time of this. But um, I think this picture, and that's why I'll, I'll show the age composites down below as well, but I think photos of her at the time are going to be helpful in this case, especially considering that we think this is a foul play situation. Let's start with the basics at three news. The day was Sunday, August 6th, 1989. Aransas Pass Police Captain Kyle Rhodes said, the way the initial report came in, she was going to meet a friend to have a sleepover and she never met at the meeting point, which was the local elementary school. Uh, so right off the bat, you know, we always try to point out the conflicting information. There, I don't believe there was any plans for a sleepover. I think there's some information that the captain is mashing together about this case. I did see on the police website write up about this case that they found a witness that said that Elisa had been at a sleepover, but I believe that was Saturday night. And then that friend walked her home and dropped her off at home on Sunday. Um, an important thing to know about the family is at this point, 
Um, we've got the kids and the mother living together. The father's not in the picture at this point, and the mother does not have a car. So pretty typical for them to go walking and uh, great, great insight about those elements and about some of the social dynamics in this case uh, can be found over at the Unfound podcast. My hat's off to Ed Denzel. He does an in-depth interview with Elisa's sister, Ruby. I highly recommend that you check it out if you're looking for that extra deep layer in terms of understanding um, some of those dynamics. Of course, we're going to cover all the main points and kind of try to stick to the facts as much as possible, but I will weave in a little bit of the social information here and there where, where we need to. This is just one of those things. I think it's an unfortunate mashup of two different points in the police captain's mind and kind of gave us a statement that isn't entirely accurate here. But uh, the last place Elisa was ever seen was at the corner of Greenwood and South Whitney. A police report cites a neighbor spotting the girl walking and stopping to speak with her. Well, we're two paragraphs in and we're already at two discrepancies. A little bit of a problem with that citing because uh, I've got approximate addresses in here for where she started, which was in the 400 block of South Whitney, uh, where the elementary school is that they were supposed to meet up at, which is, uh, it's Keyberger. It's pronounced Keyberger, at least according to the local press. Uh, and then where her friend lived, which also worth noting, is a place where Elisa's family used to live. It's a duplex and uh, this friend that's a few years younger than Elisa, that's how they got to know each other. So the plan is the friend is going to walk a little bit more than halfway to the elementary school. Elisa is going to walk to the elementary school. They're going to meet up there. They're going to walk back together. When the friend's father gets home, he's going to bring Elisa back home in a car. Um, in terms of this sighting being problematic for me, we can see the path here is pretty direct. The street that they're saying is Greenwood and her being spotted at Greenwood and Whitney heading to that particular location doesn't make a lot of sense. It basically has her go on a block and a half kind of in the wrong direction. So I don't think that's what happened. Elisa is one of four siblings. Um, we've got basically two boys and two girls. Her sister Ruby was only 12 when her sister disappeared. Quote, she was the protective one. She was the one watching over, a big sister watching over the little ones, making sure we were being taken care of. And of course, she still remembers the last day she saw her sister, Elisa. I do remember my mom saying it was getting late and she would probably need to stay home, but she talked my mom into allowing her to go back out. She was going to meet a friend of ours. And let's continue with some more detail over at NBC News. Ruby describes her sister as a cool kid, a true product of 1980s hair bands and MTV. Everybody seemed to like her. She had so many friends. And I was the tag along little sister that wanted just to keep up with her and was so excited to be able to hang out with her. The eldest of four siblings, Elisa, was the only one born in Nicaragua like her mother, Marina Tomchek. I didn't speak English, Marina told Dateline. She was the one that helped me all the time when I went to appointments with the doctor or wherever I had to fill out paperwork. She was my translator. So we could see that not only is she the oldest sister, she's also a big help to her mother who, like I mentioned, is alone at this time. And apparently there's kind of a on again, off again boyfriend situation that's happening around this. And based on what Ruby is saying now, this is not a good person. This is a guy that was abusive. Uh, he was a drug trafficker as well. Um, so of course, one of the people that we have to kind of be cautious of in, in terms of what's happening around this story. Um, but we can see that uh, Elisa was just a very important member of her family. Marina described Elisa as a mature child who acted as a sort of little mom for her siblings. She was a blessing for the whole family. She was like the soul of the home. Of course, we know Lisa heads out on this walk, only supposed to be about a six minute walk until the meetup point. The Robersons spent that late afternoon Sunday at home. Then the phone rang. Debbie called our house and asked if Elisa was there, Ruby said. Elisa never showed up at the school. Panic set in. Marina and Ruby began calling Lisa's friends, asking if anybody had seen her, while Debbie and her father drove around looking for her. And at around 9.45, Marina called the police. And basically, um, Ruby talks about in the Unfound podcast that that was at the request of Debbie's father. Basically, Debbie's father and Debbie go driving around. Keep in mind, um, 
that uh, Marina does not have her own vehicle. So they're on foot out looking for her as well. Um, but the father basically circles back to the home and says, you know, you need to call the police. So the call does happen around 945. The investigation hits a little bit of a hiccup in terms of the first responder police officer that shows up to take the report apparently doesn't know that there is another investigator that he's supposed to notify someone that has been assigned for for handling um, these types of cases and that investigator is actually familiar with marina's family i think in part due to some of the abusive stuff that was happening with the boyfriend his name is ralph uh, that kind of comes and goes around this situation but basically that investigator that didn't get notified isn't notified until the next morning. And she's someone that is still helpful to the family. She's retired now. Um, and she's basically always been of the mind that that 12 hour gap um, has kind of stymied the case. It's been something that if, if they notified her properly, this case might've been solved uh, all those years ago. But unfortunately it just, it didn't happen that way. Continuing at the Charlie Project, so the investigation does get launched, eventually does get in the right hands. They do bring dogs out to track her scent, and they do apparently pick up on her trail, but then it ends at Goodnight Avenue and 8th Street. So if we go back to our map here, um, this one kind of makes sense because Goodnight Avenue and 8th Street, I mean, if there's anything that doesn't make sense, it's that it's actually a little bit past, well, it's right at the corner of the elementary school, essentially. Um, and it could be that, you know, she comes walking up, she's looking for her friend. She hasn't seen her friend yet, but she knows the direction that her friend's going to be coming from. So maybe she continues at that point. Um, but it's literally this intersection here, Goodnight and 8th Street. And that's where the dogs stop. So that kind of leads law enforcement to think that there's a possibility that she accepted a ride from someone that she basically got into a vehicle at that point. Uh, one of Elisa's friends stated that she was acting moody and not herself on the day of her disappearance. She also refused to attend church that day, which is uncharacteristic of her. It's not known why she was behaving this way and whether her attitude was a factor in her disappearance later that day. Um, now, this is coming from the Charlie Project, and I know how hard Megan works on these write-ups. I did not run into this information uh, in any of my sources, but I know Megan basically is someone that is only citing newsworthy sources. So, but just to point out, I'm not exactly sure where that assessment's coming from. Uh, I mean, she's saying it's coming from one of her friends, but I don't, I have not been able to find those quotes. So unfortunately there's search efforts, there's posters, um, we get the family saying that, you know, they, they do speak to some other people in the neighborhood and we have these kind of sprinkles of traces of like, oh, I saw her that night or she headed off in this direction. Um, but then that's about it. And the years, unfortunately, start ticking by. In 1994, uh, it's decided that they're going to do a mailing. They've got an, uh, kind of an age progression that they've done at this point to 18 years. Um, and this is, it's interesting to hear how they did this back at that time, uh, you know, morphing was kind of a big technology. You might remember it from that Michael Jackson video where people's faces are changing from one to the next. They essentially took uh, a picture of Elisa, a picture of her mother, and I think some other family members, and they did a morph of those photos, kind of morphing the features together to create this age progression. But this gets sent out to just like it's a huge mailing that happens nationwide. Um, and we can see it's also mentioning the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children here. Uh, that does seem to have some form of effect. Eff effectively, uh, we do have local police saying that they've got a bunch of tips that comes in based off that. And now they're having to work those tips. What are those tips saying? One caller talked about seeing Elisa at a high school in Bale, North Carolina. Uh, of course, investigators reached out to Bale police. They sent a photo of Elisa out there. And this officer says, I think I got her. This girl is a dead ringer. Uh, of course, they look into this girl more and they find her school records that show that she has been there her whole life. So it's obviously not Elisa. An apartment manager in Villas, New Jersey reported that she had shown an apartment to someone who looked like Elisa. 
they sent a photo out to that area. They showed it to people around the apartment complex, but no one recognized her. Another caller from Tulsa, Oklahoma reported seeing a news report about a dead body that had been found in Tulsa. The caller said that Elisa's photo resembled an illustration of what the dead woman would have looked like alive. Uh, they called the Tulsa police who told them that the body had already been identified and it was not Elisa. So the advertising push certainly got the awareness out there, got some tips called in. Unfortunately, it's just none of the tips are actually panning out. At the six year mark, we do have a comment from her mother, Marina. Mike Thompson, a detective with the Arantes Pass Police Department said that police have no leads in the case, but that the file remains open. Elisa's mother, Marina, said that she sometimes finds it difficult to maintain hope that her daughter will be found. Every time one or more year passes is one or more year, and sometimes I lose hope, and other times I say, maybe this will be the time. Everything is possible. If, if there is a subtitle for today's episode, I would love for it to be everything is possible. We're talking about this case 35 years later. There's a new attention that's kind of swirling around the case. Maybe this is the time. For this family, I, I certainly hope that is the case. Continuing with an article at Corpus Christi Caller Times, uh, officials looking into identity of found bones. So we do have some remains that are found in the area. Aransas Pass Police are investigating the possibility that remains are Elisa Roberson. A skull and more than 50 pieces of bone were discovered by a crew working on Johnson Road. The property owner was cutting through brush to create a road to the back of the property, and they found the remains right along a fence line. If they hadn't cut through this, it might never have been found. Less than a week later, there's an update to this aspect of the story. And essentially, we get experts that are disagreeing about the remains. Um, one expert is saying these remains are totally unidentified. And there's another one saying, no, we've basically determined that they're a male. So it's obviously not Elisa. Uh, from there, this story thread just kind of disappears. But we know this case is currently unsolved. Uh, I also did take a look at the comparisons chart over on NamUs, and we can see several comparisons have been done throughout the years. Obviously, these are exclusions. We know that none of these are Elisa. So those remains, not part of this story, but part of someone else's. And then we get to a news update in 2016. And this is the news update that would seemingly create some new tension and, and pressure for this family that's already been facing so much. Aransas Pass Police Captain Kyle Rhodes says, there were a lot of leads that came in, a lot of them we checked out, many of them dispelled as rumors and so forth. In the summer of 2016, police were aided by Texas EquiSearch and the investigation took a new approach. New technology allowed them to go back to the beginning. Captain Rhodes said, one of the things we were able to bring in was ground penetrating radar that we were able to use. That was able to shed some new light on this case. Roberson's childhood home was one of the locations that became an active search site. Captain Rhodes said, we explored some areas mentioned in the initial reports with the technology and with dogs. We actually cleared a field with a backhoe and did a lot of extensive searching. I believe we've moved this case forward in a lot of ways. Captain Rhodes wasn't ready to release those findings. We asked Elisa's sister Ruby if she believes there will be closure. She said, I go back and forth. I sometimes do, and I think eventually, sometime, somehow, but then I know the reality of it is that there are cases that are never solved, and I just have to have peace with that. Uh, so the phrasing on this, I think, is... It's wildly unfortunate because we've now put into the press, and maybe they had to address this because it was obvious. People in the neighborhood are going to see, hey, the police are investigating. Isn't that the house of the little girl that went missing? So maybe they felt like they were trying to be helpful in terms of putting this information out. Hey, look, we've got some new information. We had a tip that came in. We got Texas EquiSearch. We've got this new technology. We're going to go check this thing out. Well, what do you think this did, this did in terms of social information around this case? All of a sudden, it's pulled all the focus back to, was it someone in the family? Uh, now, we did mention we, we do have this kind of abusive um, boyfriend, on again, on off again boyfriend, Ralph. But I believe, at least according to the information that was shared on the Unfound podcast, 
um, that Ralph supposedly was supposed to be in, in Mexico at this time. Um, but Ruby seems to be a little unclear on that. Ruby says that she thinks that Ralph was around in town uh, around this time as well. But that's quite a bit different from something happened to Elisa at the home and then her remains were buried on the home. Like, I mean, that's the only thing we could really assume by from the phrasing that's coming out of this. So at that level, this story just becomes very difficult to understand. We don't have anyone living in this home except we've got the mother and we've got the kids. Uh, as far as I know, that's that's the only people that are living here. There's no mention that I've run into of any other family member, you know, some uncle that's living with them or some nothing like that. Uh, her father, Elisa's father, is actually working on a shrimp boat at this time. Uh, when she goes missing, he is like out in the water and basically radios back and says, I'm, I'm coming back in. And uh, Ruby believes that he actually got back to their home somewhere uh, within a day or two of Elisa's disappearance. So he's not in the picture. Um, there is a little bit of a bizarre note uh, also at Charlie Project. And again, I just, she's got sources cited here, but despite me going through them, I'm not able to find where some of this information is coming from. Um, the police stated one person of interest was Elisa's own brother, Tony, who suffered from mental illness and developmental disabilities. Uh, Ruby talked about this a little bit. Basically, he had the umbilical cord around his neck when he was born and he suffered uh, some form, they think, of, of uh, trauma from that that left him with disabilities. He later died by ending his own life when he was in prison in Alaska. Uh, but even Megan here at the Charlie Project is noting it's worth noting that Tony was only 10 years old when his sister disappeared. Uh, so the likelihood that he would be a person of interest in this case doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, she is mentioning Ralph here. Uh, Elisa's mother once dated a violent and abusive man who was involved in the drug trade. Her mother believes this man was responsible for her daughter's disappearance, but he has never been charged in the case or publicly named. Apparently, he did some kind of stalkerish activity around the time that uh, you know things were were breaking up between them, and there was uh, at least one of the boys in particular that there was some threat or worry that he was going to try to abduct. So for him to be a person of interest in this case, certainly possible. So Ruby would actually start a change.org petition, demand a comprehensive review of the Elisa Roberson case by Aransas Pass Police Department. Uh, this is the second of two petitions that she started the first which I also highly believe in, um, is the call for there to be some form of law about when a case ages, gets to a certain point, that the records automatically release, at least to the family, uh, which is something we've talked about on the channel here many times in the past. And I know there's people on both sides of, of that argument because we have seen cases get solved more than 20 years later, more than 30 years later in some cases. Um, I do think maybe there could be a mechanism, some type of option for those files to be released uh, with, you know, the family conceding in some way to, okay, if that happens, then we know that, you know, criminal charges might not be possible from that point forward. And maybe they make the decision to release that or not something. There's some mechanism we got to figure out around that because we've got cases where uh, the families just want to know, and they're not even looking for charges anymore. And they just simply can't access the files. Um, this is kind of one of those cases where basically Ruby has been trying to get access to those files and it has not been going very well, but keep in mind, we're coming out of this conversation about 2016. They released this information, some type of search that happened at the childhood home. And what does that do to the family? This is written by Ruby in 2016, the department purportedly received a tip pointing to the location of Elisa's remains. This prompted an expansive search with the supervision of the Aransas Pass Police Department, Texas EquiSearch, cadaver dogs, and ground-penetrating radar technology. Even though the search attracted substantial press coverage because of its association with the police department, neither the department nor Texas EquiSearch ever released a press statement regarding the matter. It is harrowing for our family to remain in the dark about the progress of an investigation that affects our lives profoundly. The lack of transparency and efficient communication by the Aransas Past Police Department does not only conceal the truth about Elisa's case, but also impedes our attempts to continue independently investigating the matter. 
It is crucial, therefore, to seek a comprehensive, transparent review and reinvestigation of the case to bring us closer to the truth about what happened to Elisa and to dispel the lingering suspicion cast on our family. So I can only imagine the things that this family was hearing when that information uh, came out. I mean, to the point of even that very small blurb, which I think Megan appropriately noted, this kid was 10 years old at the time, but for some reason he's being discussed as a person of interest. Um, the, the, the logistics of the case, as it's being told to us, are very, very challenging to think that her body would wind up back there. We have her friend, Debbie. We have this, this little girl that's part of this story. There was a phone call that happened there. Police could have verified if that phone call really happened or not. But outside of that, uh, Debbie and Debbie's father are kind of part of this story. And apparently Debbie's father would be questioned by police. That is at least confirmation that there was some form of a plan for Elisa to leave her home and go over to their home. So we would have to figure some kind of like did a family member, a family that doesn't have a vehicle, figure out some way to go pick her up in the middle of that? How much time would there be for this pickup window of them meeting up at the elementary school? Um, if one walk, if Elisa's walk to the elementary school is six minutes and Debbie's walk to the elementary school is 11 minutes, that leaves a five minute potential gap there where maybe Elisa could have been standing on a street corner waiting like I said, my hunch would be she wouldn't have been waiting. She probably just would have continued in the direction that she knew Debbie would be coming from, um, unless she was afraid of Debbie taking a different route and you know maybe missing her on the block. And honestly, that's something I can't kind of shake from my mind, like the possibility that maybe the girls missed each other in some way, because there's another person of interest that has been discussed when it comes to this case, and that is Debbie's father, Bob. Um, and he's been discussed for a very, very good reason. Um, basically he would, within a few years after this, plead no contest to charges of indecency with a child. He got six years of probation. He had to enroll in a sex offender program. Uh, he had numerous restrictions. He couldn't drink alcohol. There was all this other stuff that he basically had to um, had to agree to in terms of taking that that no contest plea and and not getting jail time. Uh, and as a matter of fact, a few years after this, his whole family would move out of the state. So the reason why I bring up that kind of missing each other on the block thing is the story as I understand it is Bob is not home at the time that this walk is supposedly happening. He's going to be coming home from work later. Um, it would, it would have been, you know, sometime in the evening when the girls were already together that he would get home from work and then he was going to take Elisa back home. So I'm just wondering about the timing around all that, the possibility that, um, maybe he could have been driving down the street. Uh, maybe Debbie was on a different block, but he did see Elisa and he picked her up. Now, something else that I learned about from the Unfound podcast on this is Bob owned a few different properties in this area. So if there was a situation like that and, you know, he talks to Elisa and Elisa's like, oh, yeah, Debbie was coming to meet me. Could he have turned around and taken Elisa to some other location? That's really um, where I'm, I'm kind of stuck with the possibilities around Bob. And it's hard not to look in that direction when we know about the charge. He also had another charge in the seventies, but this, this charge in particular, um, it's just, it, it seems to be, uh, something that, that you can't ignore about this case. We effectively, and the family did not know this. We effectively have Elisa heading towards the home of someone that would be found to be a sex offender. How can we not pay attention to that? So it's kind of strange to me that when we talk about having a person of interest and keep in mind, like it's in 2016 when law enforcement makes these statements that Ruby is pointing out or it's causing the family some grief here. They know the information about Bob, about Debbie's father already. Um, and, you know, the, the possibility of him being a person of interest, I have found no public mention of whatsoever. 
the only mention that we do have kind of makes it, you know, it's pointing the fingers back towards the family. As a matter of fact, in the uh, Dateline article on this case, let's, let's continue here. This is a recent one that came out uh, just this past month. Aransas past police chief Eric Blanchard joined the department in 2012, 23 years after Elisa disappeared. According to Chief Blanchard, the investigation has recently gained traction again. We we've been able to focus back on that case. Uh, we are having movement on the case, which we anticipate with hopefully within the month or two months, we'll be able to get further along in what we had acquired from 2016. So we have him calling back to this thing in 2016, which we all know is them searching the family property. Ruby told Dateline that in 2016, she and her family were brought to the Aransas Pass Police Department for questioning. She says the department has since accused them, specifically Elisa's mother, Marina, of having something to do with Elisa's disappearance. What happened to us in 2016 caused us to shut down, and it was so traumatic. We're still, as we speak, still processing what happened to us. We're fighting for answers for Elisa, but we're also fighting the accusations that the police department has put up. I'm just, I'm really curious when you have the logistics of this story, we basically have witnesses seeing her walking during this time that she goes missing. The person she's supposed to meet with doesn't meet up with her. Like how does this boomerang back to the home? Even what Elisa stops and turns around and decides to go home and then her mother does something to her but aren't the other kids there as well? I mean, that's the story that we're reading, at least in the articles. Um, Marina told Dateline the department's accusation has caused them many problems in the years that followed. They traumatized Ruby pretty badly, and me too. I quietly suffer from that. Chief Blanchard responded to the allegation, quote, until I have some greater level of confirmation one way or the other, I would never implicate publicly an individual, a family, or anybody. At this time, I won't share any people of interest. I can't share suspects. I can't share, even potentially, the belief of where the evidence is taking us. All I can say is that we do have a direction that is evidence-driven, and we're following that. I, I get what he's saying, but unfortunately, the comments that they made in 2016 and then calling them back like if he would have stopped this comment earlier, hey, we've got some things happening and we're hoping to have some new information within a couple months. That would have been quite a bit different than, you know, we'll be able to get further along in what we had acquired from 2016. He's calling back to their home with that comment. Um, so, I mean, admittedly, we have to have some trust that these people know what they're talking about. And maybe that's part of Ruby's frustration as well in terms of like, well, if you guys have something, like, let me know. I mean, she was what, 11 years old when this happened? Maybe there was by some, you know, maybe there's some piece of the story that hasn't publicly come out. There was another family member that was living with them or something along those lines. I don't know. Um, but the it, this is... The phrasing around all this stuff is really, really unfortunate, in particular because let's say it's true, and, and I'm not saying this is at all, but let's say that it's true. Does that mean that every person in the family would have been responsible for it? No. So there is a possibility in certain cases where you might have a family member that harms another one, and family member three, four, and five have no idea about it, but... Do you think, you know, social media cares about that when, when they're pointing fingers? De definitely not. Definitely not. Um, so he also said, I kind of feel like we're investigating maybe a homicide or some type of death investigation, uh, which honestly, several investigators throughout the years have, have echoed as well. Ruby agrees and says she's slowly coming to peace with the fact that her sister may never get justice. Now, I did find additional video about whatever the details of this discovery were in 2016. Again, it's not being super, super clear, but it's maybe giving us some better insight into what they're looking at and why they think there's a possibility of her remains being on the family's property. There used to be an open carport there, and it had since been walled in and taken into part of the house. We thought that maybe that the slab that had been poured in there may be covering something up. A team came down from EquiSearch, and I believe they approached the original investigators uh, about coming in and doing ground penetrating radar. 
tests were run, interviews conducted, searches initiated at two other locations, but nothing concrete. It's going to require a, a second look at that location. To hear her sister Ruby talk about it, they believe that a tip was called in and that's what led to them looking in the property in that way. And there's some animosity that has basically happened between Elisa's family and Debbie, the young girl that she was going to see over the years, um, maybe in part because of some of the charges that would come out about her father. Um, but there has it seems like there's been some online feuding that's been happening between them. And I think one has to wonder, is it possible that someone phoned in a tip about, well, her body's actually on the family property. Did that spur some of this? Uh, what's interesting is hearing the police say that they feel like they have to go back and look more or, or look again. Uh, apparently they did take soil samples. So uh, I'm not sure exactly unless those soil samples came back with some type of positive hit for something. I don't know why he would think that they would have to go back again. Um, the Robertsons moved out of the house in 1993 and the current homeowner signed a written consent, of course, to have police do that search. A professor at Texas A&M University confirmed that soil samples were taken from the Roberson residence and delivered to the university lab in 2016 based on the fact that the cadaver dogs alerted authorities there. So we do have the cadaver dogs saying that there's a hit um, of course, please watch our video about scent dogs. There's a lot of challenges with information that comes from, um, from dogs in that area. So we, we did a whole long discussion about some of the possibilities around that. Um, but we know something's being tested back in 2016. They have to have the results at this point. So to have video of, you know, the police basically saying we have to go back and look more, does that mean they found something? Roberson Hall said that, um, that's Ruby, said that while the police haven't disclosed what was found at the Roberson's old house, the blame still shifted toward their family. In 2023, as the family pressed for answers, rumors began circulating on social media that the Robersons were involved in Elisa's disappearance. Eight years later, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of time for whatever analysis, for them having to go back or whatever. Why is it taking so long? And, and leaving this big question out there. That's what I mean. Like if, if they had more to process, what's slowing that down? If they really don't, then that's problematic. Law enforcement should be doing things that are protecting citizens. And in a way, we have citizens that, um, like, I don't think anyone believes that Ruby is a suspect in this case, but she's being hurt by this. Eight years later, the case is open and no updates on the investigation have been provided by police. The Robersons are holding the police accountable for their investigation after many denied requests from Ruby to release the 30-year-old records. The family hired an attorney in Corpus Christi, Steve Kerrigan. In a, written, in a written statement, he said that he was in the process of obtaining a hearing to get a court order from an Aransas County District Judge. We are optimistic that the release of these records, coupled with the cold case experts that have been retained, will lead to the resolution of this disappearance, the statement said. And again, I think it's important to keep in mind that some of these families do not care about the possibility of charges. Um, to be fair, one of the people we talked about this in this, Debbie's father, uh, if his date of birth is correct on the paperwork that I saw, he's 95 years old now. So having holding someone accountable maybe from ruby's perspective might not be as important as just knowing just knowing oh look we look through the police file we, we look through their investigation our experts they have a pi that's been working pro bono with them for 14 years at this point our experts are coming back and saying we now know what happened sometimes that's enough for families sometimes it isn't in a case of this age i think that likelihood is much higher um, of course, I can't speak for Ruby or her mother, but that could be a possibility when it comes to this. Just, you know, answers and what justice looks like is very, very different for, for different people. Uh, thankfully, the community is still at least honoring Elisa. Arances Pass honoring the missing girl. During the regular city council meeting on July 15th, a proclamation from Mayor Ram Gomez and the Aransas Pass City Council declared August 6th as Elisa Roberson Remembrance Day. 
And that was just before her family was planning on going back to do a walk. They had also moved out of the area a few years after this, um, but they were going back to walk the path that she walked on the day she went missing. Blanca, Elisa Roberson's disappearance affected many lives and impacted the community of Aransas Pass in so many ways, and the city of Aransas Pass is committed to protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the residents of the city, regardless of their age. Let's please keep that in mind in terms of the information law enforcement's putting out that is seemingly pointing the fingers and in a much different direction on this case. And I mean, look, I don't know the truth of this case. I don't just... The, the logistics that we're talking about with this case make it very, very difficult for me to believe that somehow she winds up back at the home. Is it possible? Of course. Even if it is, should it be handled in this way where information comes out accusing a family and it just hangs out there for eight years and there's no real resolution to that information one way or the other? I think that is pretty unfair. And we can see uh, the family here. There was also a memorial put in at Keyberger School in memory of Elisa Roberson. And we have a family waiting for 35 years. Uh, the family has also put together funds for a reward, a reward that is now at $20,000. And if you have information that can be helpful to them, you can reach out to the family directly. They've got the email address showing up here on the screen missing elisa 1989 at gmail.com of course if you would rather call it into law enforcement you can also do that by calling the aransas pass investigations division at 361-758-5224 if you need to remain anonymous for any reason at all you can use the number that we've been showing up on the screen here the whole time that's for crime stoppers and that's 1-800-245-8477 if you'd like to show your support for this family, you could do that in a few ways. Uh, I will have a link in the description box down below to the Facebook group, um, Missing Elisa Roberson. Please come here, join. Uh, you can also send messages to that Gmail. They are open to just messages of support coming in through that Gmail address that we just shared. But something that I think would mean a lot to them is using the link down below to come to this change.org petition and signing this. As a matter of fact, on behalf of myself, and my amazing supporters here at Lord and Arts, we not only signed the petition, but we donated money to get more impressions for the petition. So it's going to be seen by, I think, 1,200 additional people today um, based on a donation that we made. So uh, a big thank you to everyone that helps us here at the channel. And please keep in mind, I know I've mentioned it several times, Ed Denzel doing amazing work at the Unfound podcast. It's a two-hour episode. It's a very deep dive covers a lot more of the social information than we do here. Of course, that's one of the benefits of following numerous different true crime creators, even about the same case. We work in different ways. We focus on different things. Please, if you do have the time, check out that Unfound episode and listen to Ruby tell the story for herself as well. A big thank you to people that support us here at the channel. They help make the donations like we made today possible, but they also keep us here helping these families. A big thank you to PayPal supporters Jennifer Wilson, Larissa Mertshank, and Hillary Green. If you'd like to become one of those supporters, please visit lordandarts.com today. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Casey Schaefer recently did. We really appreciate everyone that is part of our team. And that includes you that are watching. If you can't become a supporter today, please take a moment, click the like button, even click the dislike button, leave a comment. All of that engagement helps YouTube know this video needs to be shown to more people. And that's what we're trying to do. Get this video in front of the right eyes, the person that has that information, and then of course, move them to be the person to stand tall and call that in. And if that's you, please pick up the phone and help this family. It's been 35 years. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much for your time here today. And join us again next week for a very special brain scratch on the Lord Narts channel.